Hey gang, it's uh, Bob McDougald again. Hey, so this is the new FAR bar as is contract um, uh, revised on in April of 2017. So we're going to cover this. This is uh, covering section one um, and that which is above kind of the general uh, terms here. So as you can see, once again, the um, actual uh, PDF of what I'm showing you here on the screen is should be um, attached to this training. You can download it. Yeah, it would be pr uh, printing the entire contract. We're just going to cover section one in this section and uh, and uh, also the stuff of the parties above line, starting with line one. So once again, I will reiterate this every time that we teach contract class. Um, this is a good contract. The lines have been added for reasons. Uh, there's nothing that's really fluff or filler in here. Everything's important. You need to know your contract, so make sure you pay special attention to these things. I'm going to cover a couple things. All right, let's just start on line one where it says the parties. Now, if you notice here, we have the seller. We have Sam Seller and Susan Seller uh, in here at this moment. Um, those are the seller's names. However, we get this question a lot. It is, um, what if the property is held in an LLC is a good question. What if the property, when we check uh, public records, is in a trust or if there are it's now an estate situation where someone's passed away and there are multiple heirs and all, all of that let me just start by telling you the best thing you can do the best thing you can do is if you're representing the seller in particular and should have been done at the time of listing what is to have a preliminary title search done um, if it's straightforward and we have sam seller and susan seller it's pretty straightforward that's easy enough if it's held in the name of the LLC, you may put the name of the LLC here as the seller. However, the signer would have to be somebody that has that we can verify is authorized to sign on behalf of the um, LLC. Uh, same thing if it's in an estate and let's say there are five heirs, do we have to list all of them or do we list the estate of so-and-so? and therefore only the person who's been labeled as the executor of the estate is the one that has to sign. Great questions, all in, all of the above. The answer is, it depends what the title search says. I always like to start backward and reverse engineer these kind of things. And what that means is, I'm gonna go find out and talk to the title company and say, okay, based upon the current deed, the way this is uh, uh, titled, who would have to sign the closing statement at the end, the closing documents and all the, the, the actual warranty deed that transfers title, who would have to sign that? And they say, well, it looks like it's in an estate, there are six heirs, but if they can get us something from an attorney that says this person in particular is the um, uh, executor and has the right to uh, sign on behalf of all of them, then that would be good. So ultimately what you wanna do is think of it, think of it backward. Who has to sign the deed at the closing? That would be the same type of people, the same person or persons that would need to sign the contract at the time of contract. And if we're going back a little further, those would be the same person or persons that would have to sign the listing agreement. Now, if you don't represent the seller, you not need to worry about the listing agreement, but you certainly need to uh, worry about the right person signing at time of contract. So you need to push the listing agent to see if they've done this reverse engineering to get it done. So. You're going to, normally you're going to see a couple people, one person, whoever that is there, but we more and more we're beginning to see LLCs, we're beginning to see trusts and estates. All things are fine, but I would verify with the title company that whoever is signing on behalf of this entity, if it's something other than two individuals or an individual, then um, you get uh, validation that those are the proper people that are enabled and able to uh, obligate th this entity here. Uh, to convey the property. So same thing really applies for the buyer's names. It's pretty straightforward. But if a person is buying an LLC's name or something like that, that's when you might see that. They can't sign it in the name of, you can't just say like, I buy houses LLC in there. That's fine, but they can't sign it, I buy houses LLC. They have to put their name and then it's a managing partner or whatever, and then provide you documentation that says, hey, yeah, this is what obligates or allows me to obligate the entity, okay? So um, so the seller and buyer, it seems like it's pretty straightforward, but it gets a little tricky there, so just remember that. 
um, shall by the following uh, describe real property and personal property, collect with the property pursuant to the terms and conditions of the assets residence contract for sale and purchase and any riders in addenda. Um, this is called the contract. All right, so the property description, pretty straightforward. Here's our street address. Here is, it's in what county? Here's the property tax ID. I would look it up at the pop property tax records. You see that. Now, if you're using form simplicity or transaction desk, you can, when you start a transaction, look up the property ID and then uh, click the populate button like you would when you populate a listing and it would, should populate um, uh, a portion of the um, uh, uh, information sheet, which then uh, will populate all the proper fields in the contract package that you've chosen. So that being said, here's the actual legal description, and here is the, well, I'm sorry, here's the property tax ID, and then here's the legal description, okay, again, from the tax records. Now, real quickly, together with all existing improvements and fixtures, here's what's built into the contract. You need to know this if you represent a seller or representing a buyer. This is automatically built in. Unless you take these things out, they are in the contract including built-in appliances, built-in furnishings, attached wall-to-wall -wall carpeting and flooring, unless specifically excluded in paragraph 1E, which is down here, all right, or by other terms of the contract, all right? Personal property, okay? That's real property, by the way. All that stuff is attached in built-in appliances. That's considered real property. These are considered personal property, unless excluded in one, paragraph 1E, which is down here, or by other terms of the contract, the following items which are owned by the seller and existing on the property as of the date of the initial offer, not it's the date of the initial offer. So they can't change out refrigerators on you later on. Sometimes it's, it's beneficial to take a picture of the appliances to make sure they don't get fancy and pull any shenanigans and try and pull that off. So um, uh, just make sure that at the time of the initial offer are included in the purchase ranges and ovens, refrigerators, dishwashers, disposal, ceiling fans, intercom, light fixtures, drapery rods, and blind and draperies, blinds, window treatments, pay attention to that, smoke detectors, garage door openers, security gate, and other um, access devices, and storm shutter panels. These are considered personal property, all right? All those things are automatically included. If your seller doesn't want to include any of those things, we have to delete them in paragraph 1E. If... Um, uh, they didn't realize that those things were there. Now, again, it doesn't mean since it's built, if, the, if the, there is no garage door opener, doesn't mean you have to put a garage door opener. It just says if it's there when we write the offer, then it needs to stay unless amended somehow. Other personal property items, and I just wrote this up. Let's say you want to ask for the washing machine, the clothes dryer, the additional refrigerator in the garage. Note when you say refrigerators, let's be specific. Let's say there's one in the kitchen and there's an extra one in the garage. Let's go ahead and list this out. Remember my rule of contracts is that you want it to be so crystal clear that somebody could come along 10 years later, find it wrapped up in a bottle, and it's a message in a bottle, unwrap this contract and know exactly what we meant. We want to be very clear. We don't want to assume anything. We want to write everything down and negotiate, every, negotiate everything in writing. Refrigerator and garage, pool pumps and heaters, other things you can list. You may list items in here. Just be aware that if you start listing, listing too many personal items that can go, then the lenders at times have trouble with that because they don't want to lend money that on, on things or give value to things that you could sell at a garage sale tomorrow, even though we know you could sell these things at a garage sale tomorrow. But you just got to be careful what you put in there. Don't start rolling things like the boat in the garage, the um, uh, uh, what's one we say in golf course communities, the, the uh, golf cart, all that kind of stuff can be included in a sale, but it may have to be an, an additional addendum because the bank doesn't want to see that listed as part of the real property and personal property that's included, that they're going to value as they decide the valuation through an appraisal, okay? All right, so personal property is included in the purchase price, has no contributed value, and shall be left for the buyer. The following items are excluded from the purchase. In this case, it's none, all right? But you could say the chandelier in the uh, dining room, uh, does not convey, meaning it's not going to stay with the property. Now, quick word of advice, if you're listing a property like that and the seller says, hey, look, that was a family heirloom or it was given to us on our uh, first anniversary and we've been married 38 years, we don't want to give up that chandelier and yada, 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 the things we hear, no problem. My suggestion is, you know what, if we're going to put it on the market, let's take it down now, store it away, box it up nicely and just replace it with a less expensive one, something that you're okay putting in, but that way we don't have to go over Because inevitably, as soon as you say in an MLS listing, hey, this particular thing does not go with the property, 
I guarantee it's the first thing the buyers will ask for. All right, they want to make sure they're done. Um, up here, by the way, pool pumps and heaters. Make sure you note these things. Those are not built into this. Now, again, there could be a, a um, uh, let's see, a, an argument for including built-in appliances and so on and so forth. But once again, why worry about um, ambiguity and vagueness? Let's go ahead and put things in as specific as we can so that it's crystal clear what is being left and what is not. All right, so once again, we kind of covered all this stuff about the entities and or people that are selling and are buying, the address, property tax ID, the county it's in, the legal description, the two de the definition of things that are built in, the real property that's already included in the contract, the personal property that's included in the contract, and then other, a, a spot to list other, other items and a, a, a spot to exclude certain items. So it's all there. That's section one of the FAR bar as is contract, uh, as revised on April of 2017. Hope all is well. Have a great day. Thanks.